And now, welcome to Like a Boss. Insights with influencers, creatives, online entrepreneurs, and badasses like you. Here is your hostess, Heather Havenwood, Chief Sexy Boss, helping you rise to the top. Are you a coach, consultant, small business owner, or online entrepreneur? Do you want to significantly grow your business, triple your list, and double your sales conversions? If the answer is yes, then launching a podcast is the next step. You see, being an expert in your field, having a website is no longer enough to be noticed in today's marketplace. I call it the influencer effect. Being an influencer is the key. You see, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. And having your own podcast helps people to connect with you. If you're interested in having me help you launch your own podcast, grow your influence, and promote your business, then go to InfluencerGrowthFormula.com. That's InfluencerGrowthFormula.com. And let me help you rise to the top. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Havenwood, and I am super, very, very, very honored and grateful to have someone extremely successful on this program today, really about how to help you rise to the next level through your voice. And here with I'm Heather Havenwood, like a boss, we really want to make sure that you are rising to the top. So Arthur Samuel Joseph, founder and chairman of the Vocal Awareness Institute, is highly recognized today as one of the world's foremost communication strategists and authorities on the human voice. A renowned mentor and coach, Mr. Joseph's mission is to change the world through voice. Vocal Awareness, his trademarked proprietary voice and leadership training program, is designed to teach communication mastery through a disciplined regimen of highly successful techniques. These techniques are structured to, to cultivate and embody and enhance leadership presence as well as a personal presence through body language techniques and vocal warm-ups and storytelling skills. So we're going to go in that today. He's got a huge A-lister client list. Let's just say a few of them. Angelina Jolie, Sean Connery, Tony Robbins, Stephen Covey, Jerry Rice, and Emmett Smith. So welcome, Arthur. Thank you so much for being here. Wow. It's such a joy to be here. We had a little trouble getting hooked up, but I, I know about your work, and it was really important to me that we made time to do this. Thank you. So what you need to know, everyone, is I am completely nervous during this interview because I feel like he's here. <laughs> judging me on how I'm talking I'm interrupting, and I'm going to interrupt you and because I'm not judging that would be that would be in, inappropriate when I hear a voice I hear who we are and it goes right in and when but when you say that can I just jump in and make an observation yeah go for it yeah I'm like I'm yeah I go for it yes what sociologists, you've heard about this ridiculous statement they made about 60 years ago, the greatest fear in society is public speaking. Mm -hmm. That's a completely bogus. Thank the greatest you. fear in society are actually two fears, and that's why I'm picking up on what you just thoughtfully said. Fear of abandonment and ownership of our power. When we wonder what others are thinking, Arthur's judging me. When we wonder, how am I doing? We're in the white noise. People have said to us from childhood on, oh, you shouldn't act like that. That's arrogant. Or don't say that. What will people think? So if I say to you, vocal awareness, Heather, is extraordinary work. It can help you change your life in moments. Now that is stupid and arrogant. But if I say in response, vocal awareness is extraordinary work. It can change your life in moments. That's not arrogant. It's my mm -hmm. So this work is about your sovereignty, not requiring permission to be who we are. We want to own our power without approbation. Who cares? And who is it to have dominion? Who? No one has a right to have dominion over us. So some seemingly little innocuous statement like that is real to me because it, it's in all of us at some level. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to you before we got on this call, 
that one of the things I so respect about your work is your openness and your honesty and wearing you on your sleeve. And here is an example of that. So thank you for letting me share. You're that. welcome. You're welcome. Um, so I wanted to share with you a story that some, some people know I've, I've shared it before. I'm not, I don't not, not tell people, but um, it's ironic. So when I was very young, uh, there's a tragedy that happened when I was 18 months old. And what I did as a child is I went inward, so I just stopped talking. So for many years, most of my parents and people around the adults were like, oh, she's such a, like, a good baby, kind of. You know, what was happening was I completely went silent. And then as I got older and I was supposed to be speaking and talking, I wasn't. So I wasn't speaking at all, um, and I got behind. And so from the age of seven through age 14, I went to a voice coach twice a week every week from seven to 14, just to learn to speak, just to learn to talk. I was extremely shy <laughs> growing up. Um, I would, people always go, what? And then I speak for a living, right? I'm an author and speaker now. Um, so I don't take voice for granted. I, I feel, I feel awkward sometimes when I talk at the same time. Um, people always ask me, where are you from? Because I don't have an accent because my entire family is like strong draw Texan, right? I was born and raised in Houston. Everyone around me is, but I don't have it. And that's because my voice coach, Diana, who I spend a lot of time with, taught me how to communicate, how to talk, how to articulate. I'm not great at it, but if it wasn't for her seven years of uh, basically learning how to speak, speak, she was a speech therapist. May so, I interject as you continue? Yeah, go for it. There's a chapter in my latest book, Vocal Leadership, Seven Minutes a Day to Communication Mastery, chapter called The Body Speaks. We send messages through our body language. And as you were speaking, such an, sharing such an important, intimate story, really, mm. a critical story, your eyes are darting everywhere because that's our habit. Back in the days when I used to teach Tony Robbins, I have seven rituals in vocal awareness, and we refer to my rituals as pattern interrupts. And he would say to create a new pattern, you have to exaggerate behavior to break an old one. And so the importance of eye contact is foundational. So as you continue, every time you look away, simply stop and start over. And also another pattern interrupt is the axiom in vocal awareness, breath, is fuel. If it's important enough to say, it's important enough to breathe before I say it. But it's another pattern interrupt because I want to help people understand speech is habit. Nobody thinks about any of the things I'm talking about. But I'm teaching mastery. I have 20 students alone in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And in basketball, clients like Kareem and Irvin Magic Johnson I'm used to working the highest levels with, with athletes. I myself am a classical singer by training. I have a master's in voice, so I live in art. I share this because in the arts and athletics, one is actually in mastery in their skill set. But in the rest of our lives, we're not. So here, because you are really committed to being extraordinary, really committed to being extraordinary, Thank you. These subtle tips are game changers. So if it's all right with you, and you don't have to, but if it is all right with you, try to maintain eye contact. Okay. And try to with allow. the camera, because right now we're, do, we're doing camera work. So yeah. just so try to, focusing on the camera. Work, okay. Yeah. And watch what happens. It's actually going to change the sound of your voice. Oh, okay. Like softer? Mm -hmm. I will, you'll find out. You'll find out. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm, I'm game. Just, I'm just going to help you breathe first. As long as my hand is moving, it's going to be one five-second inhale. Silent. Eyes only on me. Okay. Slow. I heard that even from Austin. So this is really slow and silent. And you stop. Don't stop. It's three more seconds. I'm old and slow, deeper, deeper, inhaling. Yes. Now at the apex of that next inhale, say whatever it is you want to say while maintaining eye contact. 
Mm, this is fun. At the apex, you let it out. Ah, the apex. Okay. Is that the top? Mm -hmm. Okay. Three, two. I'm enjoying this. Wonderful. Do you want to continue your story? Okay, so when I said that at the apex. No, no. Oh, wait. Okay. But don't exhale. You want to speak on it. Breath is speak, speak on it. Okay, that feels very awkward. But, but I'm that's what we always do. That's how we talk. I'm just organizing it. Okay, do it again. I'm ready. Do it again. I'm learning a lot. Yeah, you let out your air. I did. You did. <laughs> now, when you go to the gym and you work out, what do you do before you lift a weight? You inhale. I you inhale. Put, <sighs> right. So why is it any different if you want to build a peak on your bicep than speaking effectively? And then I speak and the exhale. Right. I'm letting it out. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're right. I am letting it out versus I'm having a great time here. Like that. Is that correct? So, you're in the ballpark. I'm in the ballpark. I'm in the ballpark. That's good. <laughs> I'm going to the Dodger game today, so I'm using a baseball metaphor. Go Dodgers. Um, okay. So when you're working with athletes, that's a that's a I love the fact that you're working with athletes because it's such a beautiful um it's a beautiful example. Cause you have people who are football players or whatnot. I just think I'm thinking in particular of Romo. He just made a huge transition from the Dallas Cowboys into broadcasting, actually. So I look at that, and I'm sure he wasn't trained in broadcasting. He probably did get someone like you or both. And CBS coach. Sports is one of my clients, but so far I don't have the opportunity. We Tony and I have met and don't have the opportunity to work with him yet, but we will soon because he's damaging his voice severely. And oh, yes. <clears throat> But I have other – are you a Cowboys fan by any chance? I'm a Cowboys freak fan. <laughs> okay. Because Charlotte Jones, Jerry's daughter, VP of the team as a student, his son, Shibo, his grandson, excuse me, Emmett Smith, Michael Irvin, our students, I wrote their Hall of Fame speeches and helped them perform them. So I've got lots of Cowboys ties. LaDainian okay. Tommy, I mean, DeMarcus Ware. Sorry. Troy Eggman? No, not Troy. Okay. Sorry. I love Troy. I mean, I grew up in the '90s and in, in Dallas, so I mean, I'm I'm a Cowboys freak. My grandmother used to make us all sit and watch the Cowboys with. What, she's like, I'm watching the boys. You know, <laughs> everyone had to I stop. Hear that. Absolutely, that's great. <laughs> watching the boys, like my grandfather would come in and say, "I'm hungry." He's she's like, I'm, "I'm watching my boys," you know, and like everyone had to like just shut down. The whole world <laughs> shut down while Grandma was watching the boys, you know. So, and then she would cook lunch. Like that's how that would go. Yeah. So, um, I just love what you're creating, but I wanted to talk about a little bit more what you are creating in the future and the human. Um, we, we talked a little bit about what's kind of going on today in the White House and what we're dealing with and politically. I find it fascinating that today we are in a, well, first of all, I'm going to just kind of a mini declare we're in kind of a war politically. It just feels that way. It feels like we're in a warfare politically. But with that said, this is such a, a huge time for having a voice. It's almost as if now's the time to have that voice, to be able to speak out. Now with what we have, you know, obviously podcasting, YouTube and the 24 hour cable news cycle it's like whoever has the loudest voice sometimes feels like it's winning. I don't know if that's really true, but it feels that way. So how does one become to have a voice in this kind of crazy marketplace in such a way that their voice is heard? I have a technique in vocal awareness, a principle called choosing our vocal and presentational persona. The root of the word persona is an ancient Greek word. It literally means through the sound. One's identity is largely conveyed through the sound of a voice. And the and opinion is created in three seconds. If I say to you, Heather, I'm really having a nice time on your show today. Thank you for having me on. Versus, Heather, I'm really having a nice time on your show today. Thank you for having me on. Now, the first one is bogus, but we don't know why. 
We just know we don't trust that man. And it was only because it was too high in pitch and too fast. But we don't factor that. We just know we don't like it. The second one you bought in simply because I breathed, it lowered the pitch of my voice and I slowed down. Hmm. So the persona statement says, this is how I want to be known, not how I want to be perceived, Mm. how I want to be known. First to myself and then by extension, everyone else. Something that I'm working with or have or struggling with, something I'm struggling with right now is finding my own voice and finding a voice where I feel people can feel safe listening to or feel good listening to or they enjoy listening to. Um, I listen to a lot of different people. I'm obviously very auditory. So I listen to audiobooks. I listen to a lot of people on the radio. I listen to Gary V. Not, um, I listen to Rush Limbaugh. Uh, listen to Howard Stern. I listen to people that have a, oh, that I have. Well, when this- doing, but when I'm doing this, I want you to remember to maintain eye contact. Well, this is the camera contact. and this is where I actually see you. So that's what's probably. Okay. So this so, is the camera and so this is actually how I see you. You're on remote doing a news show where it looks like somebody's talking to the host on the air. Yeah. But if you've ever done one of those, it's one of the two artist things to do in broadcasting. Because you're sitting in some distant room looking at a camera with absolutely no relationship to anybody. That's what it feels like right now, right? So I'm looking at a huge, a ca- I'm looking at a camera, but it's in the middle of a huge light. So all I'm seeing is light. And then if I actually were to look for you, I'd have to look down at the, at the screen. So, so that's for, you know, just for the exercise, look at the camera. Okay, good. All right. Because your audience will get something very different. It's important to the narrative. Mm. And and so one of the may I chime up chime sure. in on what you just said. So to get back, how do we how are we heard? So one is we identify this is how I want to be known. Mm. Two, we create our vision statement. What is the contribution I want to make that no one else can make? What is unique to me? I was working on my vision statement yesterday. I got stuck on it, so I stopped. But I did work on it yesterday, actually. I didn't know you were going to talk about that. Um, well, one of mine took me about two years to refine it until I finally got it down to one sentence to help all those I work with to achieve their own enlightenment and to enjoy their own empowerment. Mm. Wow. To find their own enlightenment? To enjoy their own, to help all those I work with to enjoy their own empowerment. No, I, I, but yes. Enjoy their empowerment, find their enlightenment. Yes. And, That's how I heard. And because this work is not about presenting, it is about embodying. And when your body hears the truth, what did yours just do, Heather? It just inhaled like you were going to do a bench press. Whenever the body hears the truth, it breathes deeply. The root of the word, may I mention God or source in yes. your in yes. call? Yes. Okay. okay. Take in the words, not aloud, Heather, of merely, not a, don't say it out loud, but of saying thank you to God and really embracing it within yourself. And what was the first thing you just did? Breathe. Relax. Breathe. Now, I want you to embody a magnificent woman of stature, Heather, and we're going to pull a thread from three inches below your navel, slowly like this, right up to the top of your head, slowly, gracefully. And did you notice you inhaled? Mm-hmm. And did you notice your inner space and your external space got quiet? Very. No. The root of the words, now here's one more. I have seven rituals I've said. Here's the second one. Just hear the words love and let go. Mm. Mm. So you don't know one athlete who doesn't have a ritual. And the rituals are not simply biomechanics. They always have a spiritual component because mastery 
is only achieved when you integrate mind, body, spirit. But we don't take these principles into the rest of our lives, into the workplace. Before we do a presentation for your show, we just show up. But in vocal awareness, it's mastery. So we have rituals that we take 30 seconds, 45 seconds to do before we sit down, before we walk in. So we're embodying the integrity of what's possible. But what's so important about those three experiences, the first body, the first impulse was the body in fear. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell you to breathe. The root of the word spirit, spiritu simply means breath, mm. to breathe. You don't want to motivate your audience. You want to inspire them, inspirare, to breathe into them. The Hebrew word neshama mm -hmm. means soul and breath. So this is foundational. So the last thing I'll say in this moment about this is we're taught that we're presenting all the time. This podcast is a presentation, blah, 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 whatever. PowerPoints, these are presentations, completely mm. incorrect. They are performances. Mm. Someone is watching or listening. Now, in the back of my latest book, Vocal Leadership, I have a glossary of root sources. And if you were to look up the word present, presentation, the root of the word means to introduce formally to bring before the public. The root of the word perform or performance literally means to carry out, fulfill, to do. A presentation is less authentic. A performance has the opera, creates the opportunity to be far more authentic and embody what we're capable of being without fear of what others might think. Well, why is that? Why is that presenting as one? And I, by the way, I really get that. And the performance is another. And let me give some background to P's, please. Because a lot of, some people know this story, people are the listener, but if they don't, um, I'll, I started in this business in 2001, traveling the country, doing pr seminars, presentations, pitches. We, we would go to one city, let's say Chicago. We would fly on Sunday night. And then on Monday, we would have a one o'clock and a seven o'clock. 90 minute presentation to free people coming into a, a room for they, they heard us on the infomercial. They show up for free 90 minutes. And then we sell them into a $3,000 seminar. We did that on Monday. We did that on Tuesday and then we did it on Wednesday and then we flew out of the city and then we did it again the next week. So I lived out of the, I lived on out of the suitcase 50 weeks out of the year. I did that for four years, produced a record 450 events. It was always in events and seminars. And I actually started work, working with speakers um, how to present from the front of the room, because what they would say to me is, well, why is that guy selling, you know, $8,000 in the back of the room? And this, I, I'm only selling a quarter of that and I have the same program or I'm better than them or whatever their thing was. And I would say to them, well, it's all how you present. Are you creating, you know, trust? Are you creating, um, and how are your words landing? And I always share the story about how, uh, so what you need to know is when we did this, there was four teams. We're always going around the country. We were all selling the same product. We, all of our speakers had the same presentation, like the same PowerPoint. Yet some of us were what I call the A team. They were doing really well. And some were the C team doing really crappy. Well, what's the difference? And I remember there was a guy, his name is Mark Gonzalez. He's definitely a New Yorker, just New Yorker guy, Italian. He, we didn't, went to New York, did very well, Jersey, New York. We went to Dallas. You know, I'm from, I'm from there. And he was still very fast in his presentation, very kind of slick New Yorker. We just bombed on that first day. And I told him, I go, this is Texas. Like if they feel you're slick, willy New Yorker, they're not going to buy from you. So even myself and everyone outside, we were slowing down our speech. We were like, hi, how are y'all? We're taking the time. So, and then we ended up doing pretty well for the rest of the week. My point is, is that it does make a difference on how our communication lands right? But how does one really find their own performance voice in such a way that actually makes them feel they are being authentic? Great question. Repeat a couple of phrases. It's, in, it's important to be trustworthy. Say that one sentence first. It's important to be trustworthy. Now, write that sentence down, please. Okay. 
and underline the last word and circle a period after the word important. I mean, after trustworthy. And at the beginning, write CLB, which stands for Conscious Loving Breath. Okay. And read it, please. And put an accent on the O. Important. Okay. And just read it. It is important to be trustworthy. Interesting. Now do this. Hmm. Hmm. And we'll do it again. And where that pitch ends up, you say the same sentence. Hmm. Gonna breathe in three, two. It's important to be trustworthy. You didn't underline the last word, though, or see the period. I didn't. Oh, my gosh, you're right. Okay. You're just testing me. I know. I am paying attention. <laughs> Don't mean to be testing you. I'm That's totally not my... playing with you. I'm playing. You ready? <laughs> okay, do it again. So there's a woman of stature. Mm-hmm. So there's a woman of stature. There's a woman of stature. No, sit as a woman of stature. Oh, sit Holy as a woman of stature, yes. Embodying the greatness in three... Two. It is important to be trustworthy. A little fast, but now you recognize that you didn't understand or underline the last word or see the period. Read the sentence, please. Okay, I'm going to do this way. Two. It is important to be trustworthy. Now let's slow it down, 25%. And eyes on me this time. Okay. It is important to be trustworthy. Do you begin to hear the difference or feel the difference? It was stronger that time. Did it feel more genuine? Yes. Yes. I mean, it felt like I was generating it versus reading it. And, but all we did was slow down, lower pitch, and underline a key word. One of the offerings that is in the program we'll talk about before we hang up yeah. is one of the trademarked elements of vocal awareness called visceral language. I'm a classical singer. I look at music and it tells me everything to do. How fast, how slow, how loud, how soft, what pitch. We have words and they don't tell us anything. No. So if you watch Ladanian, Terrell Davis, Michael Irvin, Emmett Smith, any of these Hall of Fame speeches that I write, they're annotated in visceral language in the prompter. So with this word you stress, this syllable, that consonant, this is where you breathe. So it becomes strategic. So in the program that you were describing, I've worked with companies like that. And then we annotate the script so that as we become the storyteller rather than the salesperson, and we embody the integrity, not just of the message, but of the messenger, we have a system, we have a structure. And with the top of the show, when you spoke about rising to the top, I, your listeners truly want to rise to the top, or your listeners truly want to learn how to rise to the top, how to be extraordinary. Can you see the words I'm underlining? Yeah, rise to the top or be extraordinary. Yep. Now, I went down on that one, be extraordinary. That's what just, yes. Okay. That's not as strong, though. Yes. And because you're such a passionate confident woman and you're bold enough to have that statement on your shirt (laughs) which by the way i have my shirt on this is being the boss is sexy if you're listening via audio and it's it's wonderful because you don't care it's your truth it's my truth that's right it's my truth Okay, now I don't know what to ask you. I'm totally nervous. 
Okay, so when you feel that, simply say to yourself, just say thank you and just love and let go. See how it just decompressed. It In does. Let me ask you a question. And this is very specific. I um, I did a comedy class here and I got to stand up and do five minutes of comedy. Oh, one of geez. the most scariest things I've ever done in my life. I, one of my students did that. It was the longest two minutes I've ever experienced. Yeah, I did five yeah. minutes and it was, I was sweating. Oh my God. Can't even imagine. I, and I, I can get in front of people and it doesn't freak me out like that. It freaks me out. Yeah. And the thing I was up against was two things. One, I had to make them laugh. Like inside of my, even my show, podcasting and YouTube, I feel like if I can be myself and generate and give and be a storyteller and be a messenger, by the way, I love that distinction. I, I feel like I've done my part, but whenever there's like, I have to get them to laugh, like they have to have a visceral response. That was scary to me. But the next thing that really, and I talked about a lot of this on my YouTube live about it, rejection. Oh, I was so in the face of feeling rejected and scared of rejection. And am I going to say it right? How do I say it? Am I going to make them laugh? Are they just going to stare at me? So I agree with you. I don't think it's fear of public speaking. It's the fear of the rejection. That's the abandonment piece. That's what I'm saying. You understand that fear of what others might think fear of not being good enough, worthy enough, whatever the it is. You ever, you're too young to maybe have ever heard of George Burns, but have you ever heard of George Burns? Oh yes. Okay. Thank you for thinking I'm too young for that, but yes. In his autobiography, say good night, Gracie. He smoked about, he spoke about, in his nightclub act, he never smoked an expensive cigar because an expensive cigar was all tobacco, always go out, and he'd have to relight it, and it would ruin the timing of a joke. So he always smoked a two-bit cigar so he could puff it, and it wouldn't ruin the timing of a joke. One of the axioms in vocal awareness is space has value. A song without a rest is not the same piece of music. And so timing, whether it's on this podcast, on other shows, in a presentation, the space, the tempo, it all is critically important. I, there on my website, there's a TEDx video that I did earlier this year. And I walk out and there are thousands of people and millions of people watching probably all over the world. And I'm doing one of these exercises. And I pass out gauze and I have a whole audience doing it as well. Okay, so what you just say is you put your fingers in your mouth and... I, 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 I fingertips gently under your tongue. Uh-huh. Before you do it, let me explain why. Okay. Strongest muscle in your body per diameter is the base of your tongue. Most complex joint is your temporomandibular, TMJ. 56 moving parts right there. Your jaw is capable of multiple thousands of pounds of force per square inch. So all we want to do is release tension. Right now, I'm talking to you just fine. You don't know I'm doing anything inappropriate at all. But now I'm telling you I'm tightening my tongue and jaw. Listen to the difference of my voice when I took that tension out. Did you hear it instantaneously? Yeah, it, dro- it, w- it dropped down. That's right. So this suffocates my voice. So the exercise is simply designed to relax the tongue muscle, uh, inhale resonance, listen to how I'm going to do it. Ha is in the word hat with an H. <sighs> and watch. And how nasal it is because the nasality is going to make the voice more resonant. Listen. Yeah. And I'll talk you through it. We'll do it together. If you okay. Do. Okay. Your fingertips, tongue resting on your fingertips, very flaccid. Yeah. Uh, okay. That was not a bad job at all for a first try. Thank you. 
Now say, when I speak, I need to be aware, but we're going to breathe before we say it. In three, two, and speak on the full breath. I forgot what I was supposed to when say. When I speak, I need to be aware. That's all good. No okay. challenge. Say it. Okay. No silent, though. It's not a bench press. It's slow and silent. When I'm aware what I need to say. When I speak, I need to be aware. Okay. Sorry. Go again. Slowly. When I speak, I need to be aware. Do you hear the difference in your voice? Yeah. Whew. So what, then why, I mean, I was taught in sales. You always smile when you're speaking through the. I can smile up the wazoo. I'm smiling right now, but I'm not creating tension when I do so. Also, watch my eyes here and tell me which of these versions you prefer. Okay. I'm really having a wonderful time talking with you today versus I'm really having a wonderful time talking with you today. Mm, second one. Right, but we don't know why. The mouth is where the words come from, but the eyes tell the story. And in the first iteration, my eyes are now flat. Now my eyes are engaged, and it's a way of smiling without looking like the Cheshire Cat as well. <laughs> By the way, that exercise I just showed you, I've yeah. got, I keep on my, my phone at Super, I wasn't at Super Bowl this year. The NFL Network is another client of mine, and so I train. Kurt Warner, Michael Irvin, Steve Marucci, those guys on every Sunday, I'm there. And I was in the Super Bowl, and my, I have on my message, I have an email from Kurt where Steve says, here we go, boys. And they do a perfect, that's called a yawn side. They do a perfect uh, one as a team and, and with conscious, loving breath because we've been doing this for years. And do you know one athlete? Who doesn't stretch before competing? Of course not. No. But you're a professional voice user. We're all use our voices every single day. But who warms them up? We do in vocal awareness. I I will now. That's a really great point. I've I've never done that. You're right. It's I... so different. Wait, you watch this again. From where it was at the top to right there in that five seconds. That's 180. That was stunning. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't hear the difference, but I will, I will look back and look at it. Yeah, I know you didn't get it, but even there, your audience will hear it. The what was the difference? What, what, what's the resonate of the new one versus the first one? I didn't hear you actually. What? What's the difference in my voice? This pitch is lower. The voice has more presence, i.e. more resonance. There's more character in the sound because you've slowed down. You're breathing in a bit more relaxed fashion because you're feeling safer, less on, less judged. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Does this make sense? Yes, I'm just being with it. I like the CBL, conscious breathing. Loving, conscious loving breath. Conscious. You see, a breath, Heather, is not only physical, it's also emotional. When the body is in trauma, the first thing it does is hold its breath. Then it may hyperventilate or something like that. You shut down. Your whole body shut down. And one of the things you did was hold your breath through that whole traumatic period in your life a lot. And, and so this notion of breath being physical and emotional is critically important because it's one of the fundamental ways we gain our sovereignty. Because we none of us reached adulthood unscathed. This journey is not for the faint of heart. But I don't want people or circumstances to have dominion over me from when I was four in my adult life. But it does. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, we look at the obscenity of three weeks ago in D.C. and this whole Kavanaugh hearing. Four out of five women carry that story. And that's a startling but true statistic, as we know. We don't want to hold back for fear of what others might think. I, one of my clients in a red state has a good chance of winning for the role of her job as in the U.S. Senate in three weeks. 
And it's not a campaign statement, but her name is Kirsten Cinema, K-Y-R-S-T-E-N in Arizona, S-I-N-E-M-A. When she reached out to me, when her team reached out to me, I said, I don't believe any campaign ad ever, either side of the aisle. This is the criteria with which you're going to work with me if you want to work. We're going to make you believable. Because here's this woman, she's 41, 42, grew up in severe poverty, lived in an abandoned gas station with her single parent mother and brother for three years without running water or electricity. As a PhD, a JD, is an MSW, the only openly uh, gay, bisexual member of the U.S. Congress, a triathlete, a Mormon. She checks a lot of really interesting boxes. I share all of this backstory because we we worked. We're two or three hours on Skype, and then I flew to Arizona when we made her announcement video. And it's up on YouTube, and that's why I'm bringing it up. It's worth watching because it's annotated in the prompter. I'm sitting right next to the camera in her peripheral line of sight, helping her breathe, hit these downbeats, underline, express, not to make her into somebody she's not, but to help support bringing out whom she's capable of being. Mm. And women, when they get emotional or sensitive, often get breathy because, oh, I don't want to sound too this or too, because old tapes. Who were these old tapes fed to you by? Some patriarchal concept. Right. And when she gets strong, her pitch doesn't necessarily rise. It embodies the size of this woman. Because mm. it's, this is a, a, an important work. And I'm on this call because my vision is, as you said at the outset, to change the world through voice. I teach empowerment through voice. I teach that a champion does it differently. That's not a sports-centric term. It's no, a life term. It's a life term. It's a life. It's an embodiment of being a champion and being a winner. And being a winner, I think, is something that you're constantly learning and humble. Winning is understanding that, for me, it's between me and me. And I get to say if I'm winning or not. It's not from the outside world. Right. So it's understanding for myself, this is my personal understanding for myself that, you know, my job is to be the best person I could be at the time that I could be it. The challenge I have, and I think many women have, is that we are always looking for what I call permission. We're looking for permission from the outside world that is, is it okay to safe to speak? And I hopefully it's going to be looking at writing a book called Unapologetically Fierce, like stop asking for permission. Asking for permission to be, have a voice, asking for permission to actually have a statement, actually having a voice to understanding what's happening. But at the end of the day, it's as women, I mean, I've been told many times, well, radio hosts, for me, in podcasting world, there's very, very few women. In the radio world, there's very, very few women. If there are women, right, they usually have a co-host or the man is the, they're the co-host of the man. You know, the man's the head and they're the, you know, Howard Stern, many others. Laura Ingram is one of the few out there that's the main voice in radio. I've been told many times, well, women, people don't like to hear, listen, listen to women speak. I was told that since I was five. Tell it to that. Oprah. I, you know, you know, to me, that's, first of all, I love Oprah. But I, the only thing I could push back on that is I'm not Oprah. And give me more than just one. Give me more than just one woman. More than there's one. No and there's the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men who are head of radio, radio shows and multimillionaires and radio Give me one woman that is one, one rate, one Oprah, one. I, that's a unicorn. You're making me say, oh, I want to be like a unicorn. No, but what unicorn. I'm saying is um, everything in life costs something. What price do we want to pay is what I would like us to look at. Mm-hmm. I teach the act of surrender. That word in French means to yield or to give back. It doesn't mean to quit. It means to be in service to our vision, to our calling, Mm -hmm. no matter how much it takes, 
no matter how long it takes, I don't quit on it. So I brought an Oprah, brought Oprah, because in this racist, xenophobic society we live in, when she came up, what hoops did she have to jump through, as you can only imagine, 40 years ago? And we look at Barbara Walters, she was a first. Yeah. We look at, and she did everything, and probably including swoop up behind the elephants. And, but she wanted it that badly. There's a wonderful comedy. It's been on for one season, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Yes, I'm watching that right now. Yes. It's amazing. And I used to know Joan Rivers as one of the people, because I used to teach uh. her. And it's patterned off her, her life and other women in that time. Can you imagine what they went through? My God. I'm watching the documentary now, Joan Rivers. Um, and I've been watching, because of, when I was in comedy class, Arthur, one of the homework assignments was just to go out on YouTube and just watch comedy. Just watch anything and everything. And so I had never really watched Joan going back in the 70s. And I watched some of her work in the 70s and 80s. And I thought, oh my gosh, what she went through being this loudmouth Jewish woman in the 70s and the 80s and being so different. And what she had to deal with is pretty profound. Some of her older work is just profound. Yes. For that time, for that era, the stuff that was coming out of her mouth for that era was just shocking. The root of the word courage, which is what that took, means heart. One of my clients who ran print and digital at ESPN for 20 plus years, he was EVP there until a year and a half ago, for my 70th birthday two and a half years ago, gave me a book called The Audacity of Hoop. And as a president, a picture of President Obama on the cover in the Oval Office, coat and tie, holding a basketball behind his back. And it's his life and presidency through the prism of three on three pickup basketball. And I ask NBA clients of mine about playing three on three full court. They said, if you're playing three on three full court, it is intense and you are serious about that game. And so John, in his note to me with the book, said, Thank you for introducing me to the audacity of voice. And I said in response, John, to be audacious, we first have to believe in our own possibility. So audacity is huge. And if you look that word up, it means intrepid, fearlessly daring, courageous. And I'm just, you know, Today has been a really meaningful time. I, there's so we could go on for days, obviously, but I know we're nearing the end of our time. Yes, we are. I'm looking at the time. Yes, we are nearing the time. I want to make sure everyone knows where to get a hold of you. You have actually have a special. You can go to heatherhavenwood.com forward slash voice, and it's actually going to be rerouted to Arthur's website. Um, you can also just give your website Arthur directly if you'd like. Vocalawareness.com. Vocalawareness.com. That's vocalawareness.com. And if anyone writes, I always respond. Oh, nice. And can they find your books on Amazon? Amazon, my website, everywhere. Okay, great. That's arthurawareness.com. Well, as we wrap it up, um, what can you just share with us in wrapping it up and how can people really tap into their own personal voice and power? Summarizing. Create your persona statement. Identify how you want to be known without approbation. Two, use the rituals I'm teaching. Engage source at all times because it will make you safer. Wonderful. Wow. Okay, three. Go ahead. Create your vision statement. Be very clear about what you want to contribute while you're on this journey. It's been a real joy, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Honestly, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're really glad to and grateful for being here. Um, please check out Vo Arthur at vocalawareness.com and check me out at heatherhavenwood.com for that special. Again, that's heatherhavenwood.com forward slash voice. All right, everyone, this is Heather Havenwood, Like a Boss. Until the next time. Are you a coach, consultant, small business owner, or online entrepreneur? Do you want to significantly grow your business, triple your list, and double your sales conversions? 
If the answer is yes, then launching a podcast is the next step. You see, being an expert in your field, having a website is no longer enough to be noticed in today's marketplace. I call it the influencer effect. Being an influencer is the key. You see, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. And having your own podcast helps people to connect with you. If you're interested in having me help you launch your own podcast, grow your influence, and promote your business, then go to InfluencerGrowthFormula.com. That's InfluencerGrowthFormula.com. And let me help you rise to the top. Thank you for listening to Like a Boss, helping you rise to the top. Join Heather's Mastermind at InfluencerTribe.com, where she helps you become an influencer and dominate your field. Follow Heather Havenwood on Instagram. Interested in interviewing or scheduling a call with Heather? Go to CallWithHeather.com. For more, go to HeatherHavenwood.com.